general try to establish guide to the cinema uh, featuring Slavo and Zizek uh, will be shown and when it's come to take place. Now, uh, Slavo is the international director of the Blackbird Institute for the Humanities and he's currently in the middle of a master class on Lacan which takes place in this very room every Tuesday and uh, Thursday for the next three weeks uh, at Chiopo. So he is very much part of the like the uh, humanity establishment. And I should also say, just to finish, that uh, those of you who have read Hegel, the philosophy of right, Hegel says that the owl of Minerva flies at dusk. Now, because Minerva is the Latin bastardization of Athena, Athena, the goddess of wisdom. And Hegel's position is that philosophy of theory comes to understand what happens in a particular historical period only towards the end of that period. But somehow, philosophy of theory runs behind historical events, uh, the uh, political becoming, political historical becoming. Now, I would say that Slavo Zizek is clearly the owl of Athena. He is someone who I think is making extremely important interventions in allowing us and helping us to understand the difficult social, political, international situation we live in. Uh, so welcome very much, uh, Slavoj, and we look forward to this in your talk. Thanks very much. <coughs> I am honored to be here. Thanks for this kind of invitation. Just, I cannot abstain from making a direct reference to your gracious introduction. <laughs> Namely, yes, Hegel said the whole of Minerva flies at right. the dust. Why? Because Hegel was a materialist. He knew that the real social process determines consciousness. Marx then, as we all know, turned around Hegel in the idea in an idealist way and thought that, you know, first you have thought, then thought translated into being. You know? So we should maybe change the entire perspective that it was Marx who did an idealist reversal of Hegel. More about this tomorrow in this very group. Okay. Uh, today I would like to surprise you if some of you know me a little bit and know that I never stick to the title of my talk, I would like to say something really about violence, modalities of violence, what do they mean to uh, And Especially modalities that we try to find violence or intolerance like respect and so on. Uh, let me begin with an anecdote. I visited some two years ago the University of Champaign in Illinois, close to Chicago. There I was taken to a restaurant, this was you see the meaning immediately just after the last uh, US attack on Iraq. I was taken to a restaurant which offered on the menu Tuscan fries. I asked friends what this is. They explained it to me. The owner of the restaurant wanted to appear patriotic apropos the French position to the US attack on Iraq, so he followed the US Congress and renamed French fries Freedom Fries. However, the progressive members of the faculty the majority of his customers, threatened to boycott the place if Freedom Fries remained on the menu. <laughs> so the owner didn't want to lose his customers, but he also didn't want to appear unpatriotic. So he invented, I spoke with him, a new name, Tuscany Fries. He said, it's close to France, at the same time, you know, Diane Lane, Summer and Tuscany, all those movies give the right association. Uh, so that's what he did, invented a new name. Now, in a move similar to the one by the U.S. Congress, maybe you know that after those uh, Muhammad caricatures, uh, outrage in the Muslim world, Iranian authorities ordered the bakeries to change the name of Danish pastry into Roses of Muhammad. <laughs> My initial observation is just that I would, it would be nice to live in a world in which the U.S. Congress would change the name into, from French fries into Muhammad's fries, and the Iranian authorities' Danish pastry into freedom pastry. But the prospect of tolerance, respect for otherness, and so on, is the one in which, I'm afraid, our stores and restaurants menus will be more and more full of the different versions of Tuscany fries. What lurks at the horizon if we follow this path? is, I think, the nightmarish prospect of a society regulated by a perverse pact between religious fundamentalists and the politically correct preachers of tolerance and respect for the other's beliefs. 
A society immobilized by the concern for not hurting the other, no matter how cruel and superstitious this other is, and in which individuals will be engaged in regular rituals of witnessing their own victimization. The problem for me is how to avoid this. In other words, I claim not only is violence a problem today, as a good Hegelian reflexive thinker, I think that the very way we perceive the problems of violence and try to <coughs> fight it is part of the problem, is not a solution. So, is there a different approach? Okay, let me begin, not that I think that this really is an outstanding example of violence, but because our media were full of it, let me begin with those infamous, now it's already a couple of years ago, I think, uh, demonstration in some Islam Muslim dominated countries against the Danish pastry, whatever caricatures. The irony not to be missed, it's a simple observation, but I think it's crucial, is that probably 99.99, .99, like the result of Stalinist elections, percent of the, of the thousands who felt offended by and demonstrated against the Muhammad caricatures had never even seen these caricatures. That's Simple observation, but it's crucial. This fact confronts us with another, less attractive aspect of globalization. The so-called global informational village is the condition of the fact that something that took place in an obscure daily newspaper in Denmark caused such a violent sphere in a faraway Muslim country. It is as if, all of a sudden, Denmark and Syria, or Pakistan, or Egypt, or Afghanistan, or Lebanon, or Indonesia, are neighboring countries. This is what those who see globalization simply as a chance for the entire Earth to emerge as a unified space of communication, bringing together all humanity, this is what they fail to notice. Since a neighbor is, as Freud suspected long ago, primarily a traumatic intruder, someone whose different way of life materialized in his or their social practices and rituals disturb us, disturbs us, throws off the rail, the balance of our way of life. When a neighbor comes too close, this can also, and as a rule it does, give rise to aggressive reactions aimed at getting rid of this disturbing intruder. Namely, the neighbor is the one who is close to us, but the problem with the neighbor is that it's by definition always too close. You know, it's like for Hitler there were always too many Jews, no matter how. It's the neighbor is all, like, if some of you know Germany, you know Hamburg, the city. You know that the northern suburb of Hamburg is called Altona. You know, if it's not true then, as the Italians put it, se non è vero e ben trovato. But you know what's the local mythology of this term? That in some medieval times, when Hamburg was a smaller town, this was the northern, not even suburb, a Danish village. And that the Hamburger people nicknamed it Altone, all too close. You know, the other is all, always all, all, too, all too close. So, what I'm claiming is that, let's not forget that in today's ideological constellation, global, more communication that is to say, the fact that through this global informational village, however we poli uh, politely describe it, we are thrown different ways of life and so on, all of a sudden, it's more together, means at first, and above all, more conflict, more violence. This is why, the first, I hope, provocative thought, I think that we should maybe neglect a little bit, keep it behind this attitude of we understanding each other, we should understand each other, try to uh, integrate ourselves into the other's way of life. Maybe we should supplement this attitude by the attitude of getting out of each other's way, by maintaining an appropriate distance, by a new code of discretion. We find it easier to tolerate different ways of life precisely on account of what the critics of our civilization often denounce as our weakness and failure, namely the alienation of social life. So I'd like to propose a short celebration of alienation. Alienation means also that distance is included into the very social texture. Even if I live side by side with others, 
the normal state is to ignore them. I am allowed not to get too close to others. I move in a social space where I interact with others, obeying certain external mechanical rules without sharing the other's inner work. And perhaps, again, the lesson to be learned is that sometimes a dose of alienation is indispensable for the peaceful coexistence of ways of life. Sometimes alienation is not a problem, but a solution. Again, I think that this is, if we should detect Eurocentrism somewhere, it is precisely in this obsessive attitude to unify, to understand the other. Why not, why not maintain a distance? I wouldn't like everybody to understand me. I would like to have I would like to have a selective attitude. There are people, individuals, uh, uh, social groups, ethnic groups whom I want to understand. There are many others whom I don't want to understand. And I don't hate them. And I think we should accept that this is not automatically racism. We should be permitted to be selective. That's my first observation. So again, I think that the problem is precisely that we try to understand maybe Muslims too much in so far as we are not Muslims some of you are. Muslims try to understand ourselves too much. The problem is not so much that there is a deep mystery in the other, in the sense of you will never really understand me. The problem is that what if there really is nothing to understand? You know, not that in reality we are just blind puppets, but in the sense of I'm more and more convinced that, that you remember when you are witnessing but this happens more often in movies than in real life. And you are witnessing some intense, mysterious, religious, spiritual, or sacred experience. You don't understand it. You just know something extremely intense is going on. You always presuppose that you miss the meaning which those who are involved in it somehow must get it. But I don't think this is the case. I think that in all authentic rituals, and that's what I find almost liberating about a ritual, you participate in something the meaning of which is not clear even to you. I think that the, if you want to put it in this way, original experience of the sacred is something has a deep meaning, but you don't know what this meaning is. And this is why I think that even revolutionaries shouldn't be afraid to adopt this attitude towards the sacred. Because if you, you have this attitude, it means something I don't know what. This means the meaning is open. For me, sacred can also be an opening space to put our meaning into it. Okay, that's the first observation. Let's go on. The second feature that we should bear in mind, apropos of these violent outbursts, is another obvious fact, which is, I think, too much neglected, that the process, the protests, and their very real violence were triggered by means of representations, words, images. The Muslim crowds did not react to caricatures as such. They didn't know. Them. They reacted to the complex figure, image of the West, which was perceived as the attitude behind the caricatures. What exploded in violence was, as we all know, a complex cobweb of symbols, images, attitudes. Western imperialism, godless materialism and hedonism, the suffering of Palestinians, and so on and so on that became attached to Danish caricatures, which is why the hatred then slowly expanded from caricatures to Denmark as a country, then to Scandinavia, then to Europe, then to the West in general, as if all these humiliations and frustrations got condensed in the caricatures. And again, we should bear in mind that this condensation was a fact of language, of constructing, imposing a certain symbolic figure. This simple and all too obvious fact should compel us to render problematic the idea, now my second thesis proposal, the idea propagated lately by Jürgen Habermas, but also not strange to a certain Jacques Lacan, I mean some of his works, the idea that language, symbolic order, is the medium of reconciliation, mediation, of peaceful coexistence, as opposed to the violence of immediate raw confrontation. The idea is that in language, instead of exerting direct violence on each other, we debate, we exchange words, and such an exchange, even when it is aggressive, presupposes a minimum of a symbolic path of the recognition of the other. 
The idea is thus that in the far as Lepidus gets infected by violence, this occurs under the influence of contingent empirical pathological in the Kantian sense. Circumstances which distort the inherent logic of symbolic communication. That's the Habermasian idea. Incidentally, you find it even in early Lacan, where it's the imaginary investments which distort the pure symbolic exchange. As if, again, language in itself is a peaceful, egalitarian medium of exchange. It gets only pathologically disturbed. My counter question, what if, however, human, humans exceed animals in their capacity for violence precisely because they speak? What if language, not primitive egotistic interests, what if language is the first and great divider, not decider, as I think President Bush defined himself a couple of weeks ago, but divider? What if it is because of language that we and our neighbors can live in different worlds even when we live on the same street? What this means is that verbal violence is not a secondary distortion, but the ultimate resort of every specifically human violence. Let me take anti-Semitic pogroms, but of course you can replace Jews with Arabs, uh, blacks, whoever. So, racist violence. Anti-Semitic pogroms do not react to what they found intolerable and rage-provoking in, to the immediate reality of Jews, but to the image, the figure of the Jew, constructed symbolically and circulating in their tradition. The catch, of course, is that you cannot simply distinguish the way the Jews appear to us to the way the Jews are really in themselves. I don't mean by this that there is a smoke that must have been fired, like if all this is true, then Jews must have been guilty. I simply mean that the way the Jews are perceived by others affects the self identity experience of Jews themselves. So again, what makes, we should never forget it, even if you have the most brutal immediate confrontation, uh, a white idiot beating a Jew or an African or whomever, what makes the real Jew or African or Arab that an anti-Semite encounters on the street intolerant, what the anti-Semite tries to destroy when he attacks the Jew? The true target of his fury is this fantasmatic dimension, which is symbolically constructed. So, precisely when we are dealing with the scene of a furious crowd, attacking, burning buildings and cars, lynching people, we should never forget that the, the placards, the posters, whatever that they are carrying, that all this is sustained by symbolic medium. You get my, you get my point? This, absolute excess of violence, destruction, is precisely because we live in the world of language. Again, you got my point. I not, when I say, use the term here, symbolic violence, I don't mean it primarily in this Bourdieu sense, how the relations of, 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 of authority, master, pupil, encoded in very language, but a much more elementary thing that, and here even somebody like Heidegger was right, we shouldn't be afraid to learn from him when, in his bombastic poetic style, he emphasizes Gewalt, the original violence of speech. It is simply, isn't it, how to put it, with empirical, physical violence, we change things within the world. But isn't it, in a way, a much greater violence to make the world itself different? Isn't this, in a way, the ultimate violence? I am here, you are there, we are very close in the same space, but there is a radical break between how I, how you perceive this violence. That's the gap. That's the gap that we should be into account. So, what is the lesson of this? The lesson is that we should resist the fascination, being too fascinated by what I tend to call subjective violence. Violence enacted by social agents evil individuals, disciplined repressive apparatuses, fanatical crowds, cold murderers, whatever. You know, this violence on which we usually focus, bureaucratic apparatus, murderers, enraged mob, secret police, there we know who is doing it. This violence is just the most visible peak of the triangle, which comprises also symbolic violence, in the sense that I briefly described it, and 
The third element I claim something that following uh, Etienne Balibar I intended to call objective systemic violence. What do I mean by that? Let me return to Marx a little bit. When Marx describes the mad self-enhancing circulation of capital, whose solipsistic path of self-degradation, self-reproduction, is uh, reaching its climax, its climax in today's speculations on futures, it is far too simplistic to claim that the specter of this self-engendering monster that pursues its path disregarding any human or environmental concern, that this is an ideological abstraction, and that one should never forget that behind this abstraction there are real people, natural objects, and so on, uh, on which the capital fits itself like a gigantic parasite. You know, this would be the classical humanist criticism. Yes, people may speculate with future in the city of London on, on, on Wall Street, but we should never forget that this is just a big ideological dream. All this is sustained by its real people, individuals working in reality and so on and so on. This is too simple. It misses what Marx called the dimension of real abstraction. That is to say, the problem is that this abstraction, the notion of capital as in this virtual space of financial speculations reproducing itself, this abstraction is not only in our financial speculators' misperception of social reality. It is real in the precise sense of determining the structure of the very material social processes. Isn't it that some rumor which causes uh, a downfall or confusion on the stock market is something that happens precisely in this virtual space of speculation, but as we all know, it can have extremely real in the sense of reality social consequences. My God, sometimes if it's a small vulnerable nation, a whole nation can go bankrupt. Hundreds of thousands of people can lose jobs. You remember which one such example which caused even a little bit of anti-Semitism, unfortunately. You remember how Soros' speculations with some Eastern currencies, I think, or with pound, it isn't here with pound. This was purely virtual playing, but it, in Malaysia, I know, it cost tremendous suffering and so on. This, I think, is systemic violence at its most elementary. We have social realities. This social reality is determined, among other things, by the reproduction of the capital. The reproduction of the capital is a kind of a monstrous machine which operates in its virtual space of speculation and so on and so on. It's a monster which exists nowhere in reality, but has very real consequences. And what is crucial is the gap we experience between our everyday life, we suffer, we work hard, and this mysterious virtual entity which can determine, which can determine our realities. So, my first conclusion here is that we should, whenever we witness, let's call it subjective violence, this violent, irrational, apparently outbursts, and so on, we should never forget that they are usually, and they're not justifying them, but nonetheless, they're a reaction, or at least has to be conceived in opposition to this more invisible objective violence, the violence of the system which follows its path irrespective of what the people are doing. Let me use, I'm bluffing here, but bluffing with a good intention, I shall put it at least. Let me use the notion which I barely understand, but I love it from quantum physics, Higgs field. You know what this means, to simplify it to the utmost. Sometimes zero is not the cheapest state of a system. So that paradoxically, nothing costs more than something. To keep a system at its absolute zero point, zero level energy, you must already invest, paradoxically, some energy. So in a rude analogy, the social nothing, the stasis of a system, its mere reproduction without any changes, costs more than something sometimes, costs more than a change. It demands a lot of energy. So sometimes the first gesture to provoke a change in a system is to withdraw activity, to do nothing. I think that this objective systemic violence is maybe something, another bombastic metaphor, uh, like the notorious dark matter in physics, the counterpart to the all-too-visible subjective violence. 
objective violence, although invisible, had to be taken into account if one is to account for the otherwise irrational explosions of subjective violence. The catch is that subjective and objective violence can't be perceived from the same standpoint. Subjective violence is experienced as such against the background of the non-violent zero level, as a perturbation of the normal peaceful state of things. Things were going normal in our society and look all of a sudden irrational outbursts, demonstrations, killings, whatever. However, objective violence is precisely the violence sustaining this normal state of things. It's like, you know, the something sustaining the nothing. Nothing in the sense of nothing is changing in a society. In other words, objective violence is invisible in the part as it sustains the very zero level standard against which, or as a violation of which, we perceive something as subjective <coughs> violence. Let me give you a touching example from a book that I'm reading now. I want to write a review of it, Leslie Chamberlain, The Philosophy Steamer. Of, you know how in 1922 Lenin threw out, okay, Lenin instigated the arrest and threw out of about 100, 200 of top religious, rather conservative liberal philosophers and so on from Soviet Union. It's the experience of one of them, Nikolai Vlosky. For those who know Orthodox theology, this is the father of Vladimir Vlosky, I think for me the best Orthodox theolo theologist of the 20th century. So Nikolai Vlosky, one of the Russian intellectuals forced to exile in 1922, provided, I think, a touching example of this insensitivity to objective violence. He was enjoying with his family the comfortable, odd bourgeoisie life, supported by servants, nannies, and so on. He simply couldn't understand who would want to destroy his way of life. What has his family and their kind done? His boys, their friends, as they inherited the best of what Russia had to offer, help fill the world, with talk of literature, music, art, they led their gentle lives. What was wrong with that? That's how he described his self-experience. Now, while Lossky was without doubt a sincere benevolent person, really caring for the poor, trying to civilize Russian life, and so on, I think that such an attitude betrays a breathtaking insensitivity to the objective violence, domination, exploitation, that had to go on in order for such a gentle <coughs> life to be possible. The Lossies and their kind effectively did nothing. There was no subjective evil in their life. Just the invisible background of objective violence. And then, of course, they all of a sudden started to experience something like strange intrusions of irrational violence. For example, in May 1917, the family could hear the sound of riderless horses galloping down the neighboring streets after such, such some street battle or other ominous intrusions. Once in his school, lost his son, was brutally laughed at by a working class schoolmate who shouted at him that the days of you and your family are over now, and so on and so on. Lost the family in their benevolent, gentle innocence. They perceived such signs of the forthcoming catastrophe as emerging out of nowhere signals of an incomprehensible, malevolent new spirit. But what they were unable to recognize in this science of subjective violence was the truth, the reversal, the obverse of the objective violence inscribed into their very existence. That's what I think, again, is wrong in this notion of gentle, gentle existence. And I claim that although we live in a world which is apparently much more sensitive and so on, this Lossky logic, I just live my gentle life, avoid violence, is inscribed also into our existence, even if it appears that it's the opposite, politically correct way, it is inscribed in it in the guise of what today we call tolerance or the fear of harassment. I want to problematize the term harassment. I think it's another of those words which, although it seems to refer to a clearly defined fact, it effectively functions in a deeply ambiguous way. It's an ideological term. Why? Because it blurs the crucial uh, opposition. Like it's ideological, it's in the same way that for me, for example, all these pseudo 
Hart Negri celebration of nomadic existence is ideological. Ideology for me, it's most elementary, is if you take two opposite phenomena and instead of allowing you to draw the line, it blurs the line. Like, what is nomadic existence today? Obviously, this term covers two totally opposite phenomena. One is degenerate intellectuals like me. I travel freely around, earn money, earn money on the way. And on the other hand, there are people who have to, uh, to abandon their homes because of war, hunger, and so on. Isn't there something obscene in covering both these experiences with the same term? It's a little bit like to quote my, I don't agree with her theoretically, but nonetheless, personally I know her, my friend Beatrice Spivak, who says that it's a little bit like when you take a, a starving, a starving beggar and a rich, fat lady who is doing her diet and claim that both are basically doing the same thing. Of course, in a way they are, but So harassment is the same. On the one hand, it is most elementary. Of course, harassment designates brutal facts of rape, beating, other modes of social violence, which of course should be ruthlessly condemned. Here I totally agree. But the problem for me is that in the predominant use of this term today in our societies, harassment, the meaning of harassment, imperceptibly sweeps into the condemnation of any excessive proximity of another real human being with his her desires, fears, pleasures. Uh, two topics determine today's liberal tolerant attitude towards others. The respect of otherness, openness towards the other, and the obsessive fear of harassment. The other is okay, insofar as his presence is not intrusive, insofar as, to cut long story short, he is not really another, insofar as he is, as I like to put it, a decaffeinated other. <laughs> so what they claim is that in our actual experience, Tolerance, the way we use the term tolerance, means it's the exact opposite. It means intolerance. In what sense? What does it mean tolerance? It means let's be tolerant towards each other. It means let's not harass each other. But what does basically harassment mean? Especially in the United States, I'm shocked at it. No wonder that I'm turning in my old days more pro-Japanese. <laughs> Japan, I love. There, you go, it's not a myth. I was surprised how this racist cliches fit reality. You go to a tech subway train, you are really squeezed among other people, and somehow your space is not, in, is, not, is not invaded too much. The best metaphor for the United States for me is, did you see that uh, 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 Stephen King, based on his novel movie, Shiny, you put just one single family, mother, father, in a, uh, a son, in a big hotel, it's still too much, they are too close, they, they explode. You know? That's, so what I mean is that if you look at it close, so uh, tolerance means let's tolerate each other, it means don't harass me, it means don't come too close to me with your desires, whatever I do, I look you into the eye, it's visual rape. I talk dirty, it's verbal rape, and so on. It's this incredible fear of coming of coming too close. So I claim that what we call tolerance is precisely the intolerance towards the other's over proximity. It is as if in our late capitalist societies, this is what is more and more emerging as the central human right. The right not to be harassed. The right to be kept at a safe distance from others. Which is, why, which is what explains, I think, the attraction of cybersex. In it, we are dealing only with virtual partners. There is no harassment. Uh, this idea, this aspect of cyberspace, the idea of a space in which, because we are not directly interacting with real people, nobody is harassed, we are free to let go and so on, this, I think, found, but I developed this in my books, its ultimate expression in a proposal which recently resurfaced in some circles in the United States, a proposal to rethink the right of necrophiliacs. It really happened. In some, uh, the idea is that necrophiliacs should also have the right to their way of life. So why don't we do in the same way as we, if you die, you know, some people it's politically correct to sign an agreement that if I suddenly die, my organs can be used for transplant. Why not sign an agreement that your body can be given to a necrophiliac? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the truth is this would be then the ultimate politically correct sex. Nobody is going <laughs> 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 uh, Against this, 
<coughs> and then to, to say that this tells a lot about our sense of subjectivity in our late capitalism. So the question to be asked is, of course, why this fear of over proximity of the other? Why the need to decaffeinate, as it were, the other? To deprive the other of his or her or their raw substance of enjoyment of way of life? Is this not a reaction to the disintegration of the protective symbolic walls which keep others at the proper distance? It is as if in our culture, which is a brutal culture of self-confessing, it is as if this self-confessing should be, has to be countered by the polit politically correct fear of harassment. Again, I'm returning to my starting proposal, what we maybe need is a kind of a code of discretion, best professed by an American writer whom I appreciate very much, Gord Vidal, who, as you probably know, he was known for his bisexuality, and a vulgar, intrusive journalist once asked him, okay, what was your first sexual partner, a man or a woman? You know what he answered? I was too polite to ask. So you know what I mean? Today we should maybe turn it around. It's not that the upper classes have this polite, uh, Henry James attitude, even if the world is falling apart, he asks you how much sugar you want in your tea and so on. Maybe the upper classes are vulgar enough so that maybe we need the proletarian code of discretion and finesse and so on. Uh, of course, now comes the next part of us. Of course, uh, this form of this maintaining distance towards the other is exactly charity, I claim. This is why charity is turning into a crucial category today of capitalist discourse. We are allowed to grab all the money that you want, which is why Bill Gates is an icon today. First, you grab 40 billion dollars, then you give 10 million back, and you are the greatest humanitarian in the history of humanity, and so on and so on. And it's, uh, so I think that what's the function of charity? It's not to get close to the other. It's we are paying charity so that the other remains far away there. Especially, I find hypocritical uh, this logic of pseudo-personalized care, you know, you have to give 10 pounds a month to a boy in Africa, once a year you get a personalized letter for him. What makes you really warm in your country is that he's <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I don't think there is anything subversive or critical in this discourse of are we aware that we live in ivory towers of our developed society, but out there in Africa there are people starving, dying of rape and mass and so on. This is the form of ideology today. Michael Bill Gates is saying this all the time. He said recently, what do all the computers and Microsoft programs help when there are people still dying of diarrhea and so on and so on. So I think that this false demystification, reference to brutal reality out there, is the very mode of our inner safe space to to reproduce itself. And which is why I think that these are the modes of distance towards the others. Either, I already, some of you also visit my classes here, mentioned this, this pseudo sense of ethical urgency. Like, if I were to say now, this is very popular in the States, hopefully more than in Europe. Uh, hopefully this will not be the case in Europe. Like, you know, like if I were to say, are you aware that in a talk on violence that for every sentence that I've spoken here, 10 children died of hunger in Africa. Are you aware that for every phrase that I read here, a woman was raped in the United States? It's true and it's horrible, but to mention it in this way, it's a fact. Because it precisely, again, the function is anti intellectuals Don't think, act, as if they're afraid that you withdraw into thinking. And it's the same even with consumerism. I remember entering recently in the States a Starbucks coffee place where there was a big poster greeting me saying of every cup of coffee that you buy with us, 20% goes to Guatemala children to help them and so on and so on and so on. It's just the reverse of it. This, this, uh, this, uh, this fake charity is here precisely to make us blind for objective, what I call objective systemic violence. That's 
For me, the ideal capitalist today, somewhere between Soros and Bill Gates, you engage ruthlessly in objective violence, systemic violence, and then you counter it with this subjective goodness. I mean, if there is a photo which deserves to be called the disgusting photo of the last decade, it's for me, recently when Bill Gates and what's his wife, Melinda, visited some children's hospital for critical children in India, you should have seen those sincerely smiling, sympathetic faces, and so on, and so on. So, I, I hope you got my point. I think that this kind of charitable approach, aiming at, as it were, subjective violence, all this neo-capitalist are terribly worried. My God, mm -hmm. people are dying, uh, rapists, uh, violence, we should do something, and so on. That's the way the system reproduces itself. However, things are even more complex. Now I come to something new, I hope. This category of objective violence or systemic violence is crucial especially for understanding our today's predicament because we are in the midst of a radical change. Till now, historical substance, I don't mean anything big again, but this I mean the objective social order, society in its objective aspect as something which runs following its own inertia independently of our interventions and so on. Till now, historical substance played its role as the foundation of all of our subjective acts, interventions. Whatever social and political subjects did, it was mediated, ultimately dominated, overdetermined by the historical substance. Whatever you did, somehow it was incorporated into it. What looms on the horizon today is the unheard of possibility that a subjective intervention will cut directly into the historical substance, catastrophically disturbing its run by way of triggering an ecological catastrophe, a fateful biogenetic mutation, a nuclear or similar military social catastrophe or whatsoever. So no longer can we rely on the safeguarding role of the limited scope of our acts. It no longer holds that whatever we do, history will go on. For the first time in human history, the act of a single socio-political agent effectively can alter or even interrupt the global historical process. So, what is the problem? The problem is that although our, sometimes even individual, acts can have catastrophic ecological and so on consequences, we continue to perceive such consequences as anonymous systemic, as something for which we are not responsible, for which there is no clear agent. Now you will tell me, but this is not true. We are all the time bombarded by the media. Did you recycle? Do your duty. But I think this exactly is in the same way as charity the wrong approach. This is the ultimate strategy of the system to counteract, again, systemic violence with our individualities. My God, even somebody whom otherwise I don't appreciate too much, like Al Gore, once, already 15 years ago, put it nicely, he says, if there is something obscene, it's big companies who, with one single stroke of a business deal, do more damage than we all, with all our, our non-processing, all the time try to culpabilize us individual. Did you throw the newspapers? into the basket simply, or did you put it away for a second? We should reject this. So, what is going on? I will now try to describe our experience here. Back to the joke that I repeat all the time, you know, the madman who knew he is not a grain, but the chicken didn't know it, so he was afraid to be eaten. We know we are responsible, but the chicken, the big other, society doesn't know it. Or, what do I mean by this? In the past, knowledge is the function of the I and belief the function of the I. We know it very well, but we do not believe it. What do I mean by this? Contrary, usually, when uh, scientists oppose already acting on ecological matters, they evoke the principle of precaution, and usually it is claimed that we uh, don't know for certain. There is too much uncertainty to act. I claim it's not that we don't know enough. We know, but we cannot make ourselves believe in what we know. Take the global warming. With all the data about it, the problem is not the uncertainty about facts. 
but our inability to believe that it can really happen. I think really, now I come to my central point, a simple phenomenological description, that we live in a horrible situation where our knowledge runs against our most elementary, not natural, but let's say part of human nature in the historical sense, but nonetheless in the sense of what you immediately experience. Our human experience, which tells you, look out, look out through the window, the grass, the blue sky are there, life is going on, nature follows its rhythm. You know, can we really imagine that all this will fall apart? I claim that secretly we don't really believe that it can happen. Therein resides the horror of the Chernobyl accident. When one visits the site, and I did but I would love to. Why? Because what you see there is that, with the exception of the uh, sacrifice, which covers the, uh, uh, the site of explosion, things look basically exactly the same as before. Life seems to have deserted the site, leaving everything the way it was. And nonetheless, we are aware that it is something wrong. No wonder then that there are some people there living close to the site of the accident. You know, these some farmers who simply adopted to ignore the threat. They say, I don't care all the chief scientists. Look, my cows are here, I live here. And some of them were lucky, they were not affected by radiation, so they can pretend life goes on. So what's my point here? My point here is that we should not, as some phenomenologists or humanists want to do, we should not, the, the reason we cannot take, here I want to defend sciences, the reason we are not ready to take ecological threat seriously, we should not attribute it to the impregnation of our mind by scientific theology, in the sense of through this sanctification of our lives, we lost our roots, our, our, our embeddedness, to, to use this term which today, because it's used for American reporters in Iraq, it's obscene for me, our embeddedness in daily life, we lost the meaning of what does it mean to live in a concrete life world. No, I think that it's precisely this, the most elementary gut sense of that's the real life, which cannot serve as a reliable guide, as a point of reference here. Of course, this gut sense tells us that something is fundamentally wrong with scientific technological ethics. But the problem is nonetheless much deeper. Again, it, it resides in the unreli unreliability of our common sense itself, which, habituated as it is to our ordinary life world, finds it difficult really to accept that the flow of everyday reality can be perturbed. The problem is thus that we can rely neither on scientific mind nor on our common sense. They both mutually reinforce each other's blindness. The scientific mind, at least the usual scientific mind, advocates a cold, objective appraisal of dangers and risks involved. The problem is that no such appraisal is effectively possible. Why? Common sense finds it hard to accept that a catastrophe can really occur. So, the difficult ethical task is to unlearn the most basic coordinates of our immersion into our life world. What usually serves as the recourse to wisdom, the basic trust into the coordinates of our life world, is now the source of danger. We should really grow up and learn to cut the ultimate umbilical cord to our life sphere. The problem with science and technology attitude is not its alienation, detachment from our life world, but the abstract character of this detachment, which compels the science and technology attitude to combine itself with the worst of our life world immersion. Scientists perceive themselves as rational, able to appraise objectively potential risks. For them, the only unpredictable, irrational elements are in panic reactions of the uneducated crowd. With ordinary people, a small and controllable risk can spread all around and trigger global panic, since they project into the situation that is about the people, ordinary people, that is about fears and fantasies. What scientists are unable to perceive is the irrational, inadequate nature of their own cold distance appraising. Why? The theory of complex systems accounts for the two opposite features of such systems. 
der robust, stable character and their extreme vulnerability. This system can accommodate themselves to great disturbances. They can integrate these disturbances and find new balance and stability up to a certain threshold, a tipping point, above which a small disturbance can cause total catastrophe and it can lead to the establishment of a totally different order. For long centuries, humanity did not have to worry about the impact on the environment of its activity. Nature was able to accommodate itself to deforestation, to the use of coal, oil, and so on and so on. However, one cannot be sure if today we are not approaching a tipping point. One really cannot be sure, since such points can only be perceived once it's already too late in, retro, in retrospect. So that's the problem, I think, of this cold appraisal of the situation. There is no middle ground. You cannot, you cannot do it. Either the catastrophe will occur or not, but always you can say only two legs. I would like, here we should nonetheless use the two terms of what I attempted to call Rumsfeldian ontology. Of course, I'm referring here to Donald Rumsfeld. You know, his famous statement of there are known knowns, unknown knowns, and so on and so on. Not only would I like to focus on the fourth term that he forgot, the unknown knowns, things we know but are not even aware of knowing them and they run our life, which are these life world unconscious prejudices. Like, we really cannot accept that nature will fall apart. We don't take it seriously. But even more, there are unknown unknowns. Like, we even don't know what we don't know about natural, what about natural balance. Now, the last talk here, if you give me another five minutes, yeah. Science and technology today no longer aim only at understanding, reproducing natural process. They aim at generating new forms of life that will surprise us. The goal is no longer just to dominate nature, the way it is nature, but to generate something new, greater, stronger than ordinary nature, including ourselves like the obsession with artificial intelligence, which aims at producing a brain stronger than human brain. The dream that sustains the scientific technological endeavor is to trigger a process with no return, a process that would exponentially reproduce itself and go on on its own. The notion of second nature is that for today more pertinent than ever, in its two meanings. First, it is Literally, the artificially generated new nature, monsters of nature, deformed cows, genetically manipulated trees, and so on. Or, more positive, a more positive thing, genetically manipulated organisms enhanced in the direction that feeds us. Then, second nature in the more standard sense of automation of the results of our activity, how our own acts elude us in their consequences. What we created becomes a monster. The problem today, I think, is that is the short circuit between these two senses of second nature. Second nature, in the sense of objective social fact, autonomized social process, is generating second nature in the sense of artificially created nature, natural monsters, and this process threatens to run out of control. In different Forms, from unforeseen nuclear catastrophe to global warming and so on and so on. Uh, one can even imagine what can be, for example, the unforeseen result of nanotechnological experiments. New life forms reproducing themselves out of control in a cancer-like way. My favorite example here is when, in you know that mysterious Swiss laboratory for uh, particle for uh, particle collider CERN. There, scientists are preparing conditions to recreate the Big Bang explosion. And some skeptics warn about the possibility that the experiment will succeed all too well, effectively setting in motion a new Big Bang which will simply undermine, if you want, destroy our world. So, our blindness for the results of this systemic violence is, I think, most clearly discernible in the debate on communist crimes. I myself, when he visited Ljubljana, by he, I mean Stefan Courtois, the author, main editor of that 
unfortunate book, uh, The Black Crimes of Communism. I ask you the standard leftist question. Okay, but what about the capitalist crimes? You know, Belgium, Congo, all the stories. Yeah, yeah, but there nobody is clearly responsible. And this is the easy way to say it. There is no co capital. There is a, with communism, you can play the game of what ideologies. Marx, already Rousseau, or whatever. You have manif communist manifesto. With capitalism, you can say it's just systemic. There is no capitalist manifesto. There is one by Ayn Rand, but that's another, another, another story. So, uh, uh, what I'm saying is that it's more than an irony that the perpetrator of one of the greatest crimes, the Belgian king Leopold, was, and I don't think he was a hypocrite. If you read, he was privately the same. He did all that to have the Belgian, he didn't know that most of the money he gave to Belgian social projects, museum, public works, and so on. He was even beatified, okay? A saint, and so on. So today, our ethical task, apropos violence, the crucial one, is double. Not primarily even this subjective violence, new racisms, new fundamentalisms, but also its opposite, the invisible systemic violence. Two things. Eight, to develop responsibility somehow also for, to, to learn to see the invisible systemic violence. And second point, that's the only solution I see, to reassert the good old socialist notion, not of proletarian democracy or whatever naive, but of a conscious collective act. That, and there are nice examples in history. For example, let me return, now I'm finishing, let me return to Japan. You know that after Shogunat in early 17th century, already, Japan is for me a nice example of a large articulated society that early modern Japan, where after they threw out the, no, they didn't throw out the Jesuits, they cordoned themselves off, they simply made, okay, not the people, the ruling class, but nonetheless, a society in its concrete class structure made a collective decision to pursue a certain mode of life and to avoid the different, more dynamic one. And whatever you think about it, my God, for three, four hundred years it worked. What I'm I'm not praising that model. I'm well aware how conservative it was. I'm just saying that, that what the tragic thing about the disintegration of communism is that at the same time in the West also, in the guise of the, of the end of the welfare state logic, the very the logic of fate, destiny is accepted again. The globalization is here, you follow globalization capitalist logic or you are out, all you can do is globalization with the human face. We call this uh, 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 third way today. What I'm saying is that we need more. We need, and, and again, the tragedy is precisely today when we most need it. The idea of a radical global intervention of humanity, or at least people, as collective subject is dismissed as proto-totalitarian. Don't do this, it will end in gulag, and so on and so on. So precisely it's this. What most of these postmodern thinkers, especially pro-capitalist one, who try to convince us, no, we live in a multiple self-organized dynamic society, every idea of a globally imposed act is totalitarian, and so on and so on. No, that's the host that put it crazy metaphor. That's the sound barrier that we should break. This is the ethical task today, to fully rehabilitate this radical notion of a collective social act. That's the only thing that can save us.